Hello, Dojo family. Oh my goodness. I <laughs> am coming to you today with my dear sister, Jade Taylor, who has touched my life personally in so many ways. We ended up living together during a season of like really big change in my life. I was on the back end of a, a big breakup and Jade and I ended up living at one of our close friends place. She was on the top floor and I was on the bottom <laughs> floor. And we just got to really deepen during that time in this most organic, beautiful way. And I've built, I was sharing with Jade last night at a dinner that we were at together that my, I initially fell in love with her and I could share all of her accolades because she has a lot of them and we will. But first I want to share what, what really touched me initially was the way she treated my dog, Hugo. And she has three animals, two cats and one dog. And then I have my dog, Hugo. So we had four animals in this house between <laughs> the top and the bottom. And the way that Jade's heart expressed itself so patiently and so lovingly and so generously with so much care for the four leggeds all around us. I was like, wow, this woman is such a sweetheart. And then we got to talking and deepening and really showing up for each other during like really big portals in both of our lives and your wisdom and prowess. First, I learned about you as a coach and a facilitator and a guide and holding those, those poles and really us being strong mirrors for each other. And then it's like, I feel like the thing you're the most forward facing with is the thing that I caught on to last, <laughs> which is that Jade is also like a, 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 an actress. A She was the star of The Magicians, which is one of my favorite series on what um, a network? Netflix and sci-fi. On Netflix and sci-fi, The Magicians, if you guys are listening. I watched the whole thing through. I inhaled that 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 show with many, many years ago. And I didn't even realize that Jade was the leading actress in, in The Magicians until we had been living together for a couple of months. <laughs> and, and she is just such a polymathic, a beautiful musician, vocalist, artist, performer, actress, like, I see you training mar in martial arts with our brother y Yusuf, like very multi-talented woman. Now, not to mention, I we're we're compelling Jade to also teach a housewife course for all of the women because she, you know, after being on set all day yesterday until like 7 p.m., we come over and she ended up making us like a gourmet feast, just whipped it together in 45 minutes. So just really a an incredible, incredible full spectrum woman that I am so excited to have here and just really jam. We decided we're not going to plan too, too much in advance. We're just going to jam and see where the conversation wants to go and really trust that those of you that are listening are going to receive what you need to hear on this day based on what's most alive. So Jade, I'd love to just welcome your voice and hear your deepest why for saying yes to this and, and showing up on the podcast today. Uh you. Um, <laughs> I love you so much and adore you. And I just want to first say thank you for that beautiful introduction. And I got teary just because I'm, I'm so touched just by you and your heart. And, you know, I kept thinking, you spot it, you got it. And I just texted you that last night because it's mm -hmm. just like everything that you're reflecting to me is just a reflection of you and the beautiful, amazing human you are. So, I'm so grateful for your sisterhood. I'm so grateful for that beautiful womb portal that we were in in that house together <laughs> and all the things that have unfolded since. And um, yeah, you, I adore you. And for me, it's I, I love what you do and the way that you articulate wisdom in a way that's digestible for people in the way that hits to the core of who people are and allows them to see like we were talking about um this yesterday about uh you were talking about like like operations right like when we're operating and I was like you yeah. do that emotionally spiritually to people mm -hmm. you're able to operate and go into the core of who they are and bring out the truth and recalibrate to that truth and it's just so empowering and inspiring and I'm grateful to be in conversation with you always and to to be here and be in support of it mm -hmm. and I'm excited I just always love deep diving with you it's just uh the best. <laughs> the best. Yeah, we we really cracked the seal last night. So thank you for those reflections and being so willing every time to go right where we need to go. 
you know, and one of the things Jade and I realized we have a lot of actual similarity in our astrology and there's a lot of water energy that we share and just this willingness to dive deep and get right into it. And so I think let's just go there today where last night, you know, I want to bring everybody into some of the conversation we were bringing, we were having last night. And I learned a lot about Jade's upbringing last night in a way that I, I didn't realize before. And it's wild because because the way that it came in was through the doorway of reflecting to to you, Jade, how fucking blown away I am by the capacity, the amount of energy that you have to create, to serve, to hook, to like you, you are just such a generous showing up for everyone all of the time, like expression of love, which is a huge part of what I shared on the intro. And a big piece that I've been learning in my life lately has been how very often our greatest gifts sit closely next to our Achilles heels in our shadows. And often our greatest gifts are generated from uh, like from painful experiences that we needed to compensate for in the past. So then we generate protection mechanisms that are like these high performing, you know, powerful, you know, I can do what I do. Like you just named the operation, the operative, the doctoring, the psychological unwinding for people and and be really incisive with that because I've been fucking through it myself, you know, and I've had to reverse engineer a lot of protection patterns within myself and have had literal operations down to the core and down to the bone and have been through. And so I've developed a skill set that is directly related to what it is that I've been through. And so there's a gift in that, but then there's also the, the underbellies and the shadow parts and the, where we're operating from and where we're generating from. And sometimes we're, we're overcompensating from and unwinding those patterns are a huge work in, in all of our lives. So I'd love for you, if you'd be willing to share a little bit about the pieces you shared with your background. And I was just, my jaw was on the floor. Cause it was like, wow. And you guys, I mean, Jade is like, a gourmet chef, but she would not even name that ever. And like, just really like such a, a a giver, a provider, a caretaker. Like that's like some of the greatest gift of being friends with you, Jade, because you're so generous. And then you shared this story of how it was that you were raised. And so I'd love to kind of bring everybody in on that and we can just explore from there. Yeah, sure. And I, I appreciate you you saying that. I think I'll just say before going into it, Ducky, my dog will say hello a couple times tonight. <laughs> He's Ducky from um never ending story. No, from Land Before Time. Land yeah. Before Time. <laughs> Oh, one of the best shows, man. I grew up on that show. We have to have a, uh, a Land Before Time marathon. I would love that. Ducky, you want to come say hi? Come here. Mm-hmm. Come say hi so people can see your face so they know that you are Ducky from, look at this little creature. If you're hey. watching, if you're listening to the audio, you can check it out on YouTube, the Dojo yeah. podcast, and you'll see Ducky's beautiful face. He literally looks like Ducky from Land Before yeah. Time. <laughs> <laughs> so, Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Plug for the YouTube. Great. <laughs> uh-huh. uh-huh. Exactly. Um, that worked. Worked out well. Thanks, Ducky. <laughs> All right. So um, I was going to say that it's it it's interesting because as you were sharing what was being um, what the reflection from last night, uh, what was coming up for me was so often, yeah, that thing, that core wound is the thing that then causes the opposite, the antithesis of that. And so as you were sharing that I'm like a caretaker and I'm showing up for people and all these things, I was th- I was feeling into that's because I didn't have that. Yeah. I didn't have someone showing up for me. I didn't have a caretaker that was there. Um, and so there was this deep desire to, to, fi- to fill that. And also I never wanted anyone to experience the lack that I felt. Mm-hmm. And so it's this, this thing in me that is like this huge, strong, deep desire mm-hmm. to show up in mm-hmm. these big ways because it's in direct proportion to the lack that I had. Yeah. And um, yeah, so I guess I'll just uh, tell some of that story, which is um, simply, simply and not simply um, that when I was uh, nine years old, my, my parents divorced. And, and before that, my, my dad, um, 
uh, I can't say where where he was from, but people can put it together, uh, that he was in the Special Forces Israeli Army and he was one of the heads of this very, very unique special group. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of PTSD and a lot of um, a lot of trauma and a lot of things that, uh, you know, in the house with him, it was very abusive and aggressive and uh, unsafe. Mm -hmm. And. I think my I have a brother and then my mom and the the three of us and and my dad um and when my parents divorced my mom needed to figure out how to put a roof over our heads and so she became a holistic doctor holistic nutritionist and um the only way that essentially she could do that is by going to New York to work and at least that's, you know, that's what she would say, come to find out it's a little bit different later on, which I will tell you because it's kind of funny. Um, but essentially, when my parents divorced at nine, she left and went to New York to work. And it was my brother who was just a year older than I am at 10 awesome. and myself at nine. And she would put enough food in the fridge that she could. And then she would put a ton of food in the freezer and then a little bit of money in a teapot and just sort of wish for the best and hope that like we would be fine mm -hmm. and sometimes we ran out of food and sometimes we ran out of money and we would have to work I remember begging my neighbor to like water his plants for a little bit of change and doing things like that and um you know it's so funny that I can feel some of the emotion coming up and it doesn't still feel alive in me necessarily mm -hmm. but I feel for the little girl that had to yeah, go through. of course you know, because because back then when I was experiencing it, I didn't know any different. I didn't know that that was painful. It was just it was painful, but I didn't I couldn't conceptualize it. Yeah, right? You didn't have any other reference point. You were a fish in water. Totally. Yeah. Totally. So now I can look back and go, oh, I feel for for her in the yeah. ways that I, I couldn't and I didn't have anyone doing that for me. Mm -hmm. And so my brother and I, we kind of had this really interesting dynamic where he would make sure I did my homework and make sure I had correct grammar. And, <laughs> um, and he also, he had this really innate way of uh, this kindness to him about treating people really kindly and would teach me those things. And, mm -hmm. and I would cook and clean. And it was like, we had these very parental, like maternal paternal roles for one another, which was really interesting. And, um, yeah, it was just how we how we were raised. How I mean, I don't even say raised. Like nobody raised us. We, yeah. we were kind of these wild animals, and because of that, I had to learn everything on my own. I had to learn to how do I get to school sometimes, and you know, sometimes I didn't go to school because I didn't have a parent telling me to do that. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of um, experiential learning. We'll call it that. Yeah. And I was joking with you yesterday going, you know, if you look at how I cook and how I do things in the kitchen, I don't know the right knives to use. I don't know the right pots and pans to use. Mm -hmm. I just intuitively am like, this seems like it could potentially work. Maybe let's try it out. And so it just became this very instinctual way of doing things. And it was because I didn't didn't know any different when you're in that space. You just have you learn to survive. Which and we also decided we were going to create an offering called Intuition Kitchen. Yes. With I'm Kate so Taylor in my new kitchen. And, <laughs> and, and, but that's also an example of like the way you had to learn you, you, the way that you were not given constructs to learn through, even around something as simple as cooking actually opened up an alternative pathway for you to strengthen the sword of your intuition. And now you are a very intuitive chef. Mm -hmm. And so that's, there's a beauty in that, but then there's also like the underbelly of the heartache in that you know, I appreciate that. Yeah. It's interesting. And, and my mom, she did, you know, from the time I was born to the time I was about seven years old, which I will say, thankfully for those who do know, that's the time that you really, you learn about what is or is not safe. That's where like the limbic part of your brain develops. So that's your survival brain. So during that period of time, I had this interesting dichotomy where on one hand my mom was the safe space mm -hmm. she was she would do these meditations with me every night because I would feel so sensitive because of the abuse that was happening and she was always very spiritual and, and a healer and all these things and she would cook with us but at that age you know from your your six seven years old you're not you're not really learning to cook you're kind of like playing you know you're like turning things in a bowl you're mixing things in a bowl you're not really learning but I think because 
uh, she did kind of show me like the love of food in that way up until about seven when she shut down because of the abuse that she was facing. And so there's a lot of empathy that I have for that experience too mm-hmm. now in hindsight. Um, but so I, I really, I do thank her for those, those moments too, because there was an intuitive piece that she passed on and then I kind of took it into my own hands and, and created from there. And yeah, I mean, we can go into some of the other sort of challenges and difficulties. I think it was just, it was a difficult time for me when, when you don't have a caregiver, you don't have someone guiding you or showing you or giving you love. And I, I shared with you yesterday, I got my period when I was very young, when I was nine mm-hmm. and I didn't have anyone there to tell me what to do, how to do it. And I was calling my mom, but she wasn't picking up the phone. And so I, but for a nine-year-old who doesn't know what's going on with their body. I just remember putting like continuously changing my underwear, putting it in a bag and then putting it under my mom's bed, thinking I'm saving my blood in case I like they need it. If I, if I'm dying, like, I didn't know. (laughs) I didn't know. I love (laughs) that's very cute, but also really (laughs) painful, right? Like that's so scary. You thought you might be dying and that just the, the impact, like the impact of that. And there is like, so, so developmentally, what have you tracked in terms of like compensation patterns or protection patterns that you had to develop? Like I'm imagining a nine-year-old in that moment, who's obviously a highly intelligent being and you were figuring it out. You were doing what you needed to do to, to survive, to make it. And then you started to do that very well. Right. And so, and then you shared something too, like later on. Or when your mom would come home for a couple weeks, it would look like you taking care of her as well. So there was a lot of um, caretaking first of your having to learn how to do that for yourself and for your brother and him to you. And then even when your mom would come home. So what was that like when she would come home? And then what are the compensation or protection patterns that you have tracked that you started to develop? Yeah, there's a lot of things. I'll say one thing about the the, the period stuff, because it's it's just fascinating to me. Um, for years I would have these debilitating cramps and I would feel like I was dying. And I went, Oh, let me backtrack. Let me track it and go, where, where does this come from? This is my body telling me something. Oh, when I was nine, I thought I was dying. Wow. I just got chills. That's wild. Yeah. So of course my body's having this somatic response and this like reaction, putting me in the same traumatic response pattern. And, and so it took a while to like rewire and repattern that and do a lot of re- like repatterning, somatic work, all of these things. So just that was because you were talking about repatterning and, yeah. um, and tracking. And so that was one thing. But in regards to my mom. Oh, hold on, hold on, pause right there. Because I think that's an important, very important, very um, pronounced example of the way that we can take on because that's so physical and literal. And I think, you know, many of us, well, most of us were human beings, right? Like we have somatic body memory from experiences of our, one of our parents withdrawing love or, you know, being abandoned or having an emotionally or verbally abusive scenario, right? Where there wasn't necessarily a physical impact, but still the physical on the somatic level in the future now moment, that prior thing is no longer happening. Meaning, you know what your period is now on a conceptual level. For example, a parallel would be you're in a relationship now with a partner who is not your father, but, and you know that, conceptually, but on a somatic level, when you get in an argument and that partner leaves or needs space, your whole body goes into the fight or flight like response and you get either very demanding or completely closed down. And, and there's, there's different protection patterns that very likely you went into out of need at a younger age. Let's say if, if your father was emotionally absent or would actually withdraw love or threaten to withdraw love, but 20, 15, 20 years later, you're now in a romantic partnership with a partner, but your body is still remembering what it was like with dad, right? So it's just as strong, but the example you're giving is super pronounced because it is this very direct, physical, tangible experience with your period getting the cramps. So you track it back. I want to kind of unwa- unpack 
how you did that. You said you did a lot of somatic rewiring in order to repattern that, because I think that's going to be transferable for people to use no matter what the protection pattern is. So can you get a little more granular about like, how did you rewire that? Yeah. So I'll add another piece to it. Um, so when, when that happened, my mom was in New York, Mm -hmm. she wasn't with me. I had to figure it out. She had to tell me at some point how to use a pad over the phone. Like it was like this very disconnected relationship. Um, and what I remember so distinctly is she promised me in that moment, she's like, don't worry, we'll do this really beautiful honoring and celebration of you coming into your, your womanhood. Right. And like your, your period, all this stuff. She promised me that until I was 17. Wow. And she kept promising and kept promising and kept promising. And it just wouldn't happen because she was working because it was just prioritizing other things. Right. And so the reason I bring that up is because that was a big part of my healing of going, is there a part of my little girl that's still creating this because she wants her mom to come and care for her. And she wants her mom to give her and honor that, that like coming to um, womanhood and in the way that she had promised, which was like, she was like, I'll do, we'll do a spot. It will do a whole thing. And like, it was just this beautiful vision that I wanted so badly. And it was really about connecting with my mom and, um, And to feel that promise broken year and year after year, after year, after year was also re-traumatizing of that wound. Yeah. And so it was, for me, it's, it always, not always, but most of the time comes back to reparenting ourselves. Yeah. And so there was a lot of um, work around a speaking to that pain when it would come up, when my body would get really activated during, during my moon, during my cycle, just noticing going, okay, well, what is it calling for right now? What is it asking of me? Let me speak to it. Let me breathe into it instead of resisting it. Cause as we know, it was just persist. And I was, re- I was in such resistance to the pain and I was angry at the pain. I was angry at my body. I was angry at all of it. I was angry at my mom and I was holding all of that. So there's a lot of forgiveness. I was yeah. forgiving myself for not listening for all those years. Mm-hmm. I was forgiving myself for, for projecting the anger out my mom. It was forgiving myself for not like just holding myself in those moments and just pausing because I used to brute force everything. I would be in pain and I would just be like, nope, I'm going to like work through it and I'm going to push through it and I'll just be fine. And um, be like, no, I have a strong pain tolerance. I'm Israeli, you know, it's just like <laughs> whatever, like funny story I created about it. But I just was like, I'm not honoring and you know, self-honoring has been a really big journey for me as of late as well in a deeper way. But that was the beginning of my self-honoring. Mm. So my body's actually asking me to pause and it's going through a cycle. How can I honor it? How can I parent myself and care for myself in the way that I didn't receive? Mm. And how can I take myself on a spa day? How can I do a ritual with myself and give yes. that? So I, so I did all of that. Mm. And so every time I make a ritual out of it, so every every month now, I have a ritual that I do for myself rather than waiting for, you know, my mom to give me the thing, you know, it's like, it's like, Oh, how do I give that to me? How do I heal? And there's pain that comes up sometimes. And so it's, how do I just be with that in a new way and have a new relationship to the pain? One of my favorite, I love acronyms because I'm a nerd. Um, (laughs) (laughs) One of my favorite acronyms is pain as pay attention inward now. Mm. So rather than looking at pain as something to resist, which is normal because our brain is is like it's programmed to survive, right? So when we feel discomfort, when we feel pain, we're in that survival mode. But how do we actually shift it into the cognitive mind rather than the monkey mind of like mm-hmm. survival? Into the cognitive mind of being aware of it and going, okay, well, let me let me look at it, let me ask it questions, let me be with it. What is it here to show me? Mm-hmm. Rather than being in the reactive, let me get away from or, you know, freeze, fight, flight. Mm-hmm. Let me actually just sit with it and, mm-hmm. and listen. And in that space, I heard everything I needed to hear. And our womb holds so much wisdom, as you know. Oh. And so it was just, it's been such a journey. Oh, journey. Super powerful. Thank you for sharing that. That just feels like such a direct correlate. And for everyone listening, you know how I love to create ceremonial field. And I really pray that there's a slowing down in your space in this moment to really 
let that land. And this requires a lot of devotion. And, and, and this is the way to expand emotional tolerance and resilience is by being able to like really track when the body is having a somatic response that is bringing the past into the present. And instead of going into the familiar protection patterns, create just enough of a gap in a space and a stillness for you to stay with the pain. And as Jade said, you know, pause, what is it? Pause and attention inward. Pay, now. pay attention inward now. So pay attention inward now, which when we're in pain, often that's the opposite of what you want to do when you, you know, that's when we get triggered into our protection patterns from feeling the pain, rightfully so before we had the tools to actually have the capacity to hold ourselves in the pain. So people will numb, escape, um, escape subtle ways, call a friend, um, watch Netflix, eat something like do anything except for just pause. Mm -hmm. Right. And so there's the, that place of pause really allows you to be with the pain. And while you're in the place of pause with the pain, that's where the application of everything that you need now that you didn't get then can actually happen. And so really praying that in, in this moment. And I know for myself, man, there's times where I've just been in a big trigger or, or my pain body gets activated and I watch myself reach for the phone, want to get some food. And I'm like, wow, I'll literally say out loud. Wow. Z like, you really just don't want to feel this right now. All right. Pause. Let's just sit. How much am I willing to just sit in the stillness and in the space and be with myself in this pain? And it's there that we can actually listen. And we can't expect anyone else to really be with us for any long period of time anyway in the space if we can't do it first. And so now on a physical level, you're like acute pain, moon pain, like big, like one, I think you're dying cramps and like you're willing to pause and be with that and listen. And now in creating the ritual and giving yourself everything you didn't get then, has the pain started to shift? And Yeah, absolutely. And I, for a full circle moment, going back to, you know, how that like the pain or the wound can oftentimes be the greatest gift is um, I, I reference this a lot because I just love it so much. The Art of Happiness, I believe it's called um, the book with um, the Dalai Lama and Reverend Tutu. And they're having this dialogue. And I remember this one passage that was so, so powerful, which was talking about how when a woman is growing a baby inside of or a person, I'll say, um, be you know not gender specific but a person is growing a baby inside of their womb uh -huh. um they are the baby is going through excruciating pain in order to create life mm. and so to look at that dichotomy of like pain actually can be the greatest thing that creates life itself wow and how do we uh, like create a different association with pain as actually wow. like pain can also be purpose pain wow. is this life-giving mm -hmm. and so Mm. And if I'm even thinking about like cramps and like, it's an indication of my body is in a process that is actually life-giving. Yeah. Wow. So speaking of life-giving processes that come from pain, so you were <laughs> now back into the story. So you were, your mom would come back, you know, you were sharing a little bit more about as you got older and the, the caretaking. So you, the question I asked was around how did you compensate and what protection patterns did you develop relative to the environment you found yourself in and the way that you needed to develop in particular ways that you may not have? I was joking with Jade last night where I was like, yeah, wow, it really makes sense. These superpowers you have. And then the girls and I were laughing and I was like, yeah, I guess we all had some, we all had room to be lazy. Thanks, mom. <laughs> you know, like, thanks, mom, because we were so taken care of, you know, in ways that you weren't. But at the same time, this is complex because you've also shared a few times how spiritual and how, you know, your mom also gave you all these tools in the very same seasons. So maybe you can speak to that context a little bit and then also the compensations. Yeah. Yeah. I think that it feels like there was a lot of, um, contrasting experiences that I had, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which, um, you know, having the abuse while also having like my, my mom is this like really loving, although like dissociative and like some, you know, back in the day, she's 
grown so immensely, but, um, uh, but there was a dissociation and also a really, um, there wasn't like the maternal quality that mm-hmm. we think of when we think of maternal people. Yeah. Um, and the thing that was challenging for me is when she would come home, she would be exhausted from work. She would be so run down from working from morning to night in New York, living the New York life. That when she came back to LA, she a was ran herself ragged B what hadn't dealt with the trauma of, you know, being in a really abusive, challenging marriage mm-hmm. for 12 years. And I think my way of coping, um, because I wanted my mom so badly when I saw her in pain, what I did was I care took, mm-hmm. I just started caretaking and I would, and I was sharing this with you last night. I remember my mom being on the floor, sobbing, like, like yanking at her hair because she was just having all of this trauma and emotion coming up. And I remember at like 10 years old, just like standing above her, just petting her, calming her down. And it was, I had learned in these processes that, oh, I get relationship by caretaking. Mm -hmm. I caretake, then I have relationship. Mm -hmm. And then it taught me, and this is something I'm rewiring still in a lot of ways. And so the shadow and the light of it is, um, yes, I learned to be a great caretaker, but also I didn't learn to caretake myself and in relationships, specifically romantic partnership. Um, I didn't learn that I was someone that got to be taken care of. I was the one that took care of the others. I was the one that like breadwinner cared to like all these things in order to um, have relationship. Mm-hmm. And so there's been a lot of rewiring and repatterning there and I'm still uncovering so much. Mm-hmm. And again, like so grateful for the, the gifts that it's given. Mm-hmm. And, and that's the light end of it where I can go to set and work, you know, a, a 14 hour day and then come home and then, you know, whip up a, a, Make a gourmet meal. Yeah. <laughs> And it's, and it's, it brings me so much joy. And that's the interesting thing is like, although it did maybe come from pain, it also brings me so much joy yeah. to be able to live in those ways. Yeah. And it made me so happy. I was like, oh my God, I'm going to make this and I'm excited. And I get to <laughs> like do this for my girls. And I'm like, yeah. so it brings me a lot of joy. And also I, it's a learning edge for me to receive support myself. Mm-hmm. And and I think because it's romantic relationships are the ones that are like the most entangled and the closest and all of that, that's where I find I'm still learning. How do I honor myself and get my needs met? Because even I'm my most recent relationship, I'll say just like a little moment where for example, if I felt frustrated about something or tried to share share something that was painful that I experienced from them, if they felt upset about my experience, I would immediately shut down my feelings and be like, oh, you're hurt. You're hurt. Let me care yeah. for you. Let me care, care take you. And, I'm, and then I forget, oh, I was bringing up a pain. Yeah. I was bringing up a challenge that I was experiencing. And I kept over and over again, negating my experience yeah, not intentionally, but it was so wired in me that the moment I see someone hurt or crying or sad or anything, literally my brain shuts down and all I can think of and all my emotions or anything I was feeling shuts down. And all I can think of is they need my support. Yeah. This is yeah. such a powerful point to just pulse on because you can feel just the innocence and the experience Jay's having, right? It's like, it's so close to the bone. It's so visceral. It's so wired in. And I think this actually brings up for me the power of plant medicine, the power of a medicine like psilocybin that actually creates new neural networks in the brain. So when you go into, you know, a a plant medicine that's, that's held well in a sacred way and reciprocal relationship with the land, the medicine, the space, the place and facilitation that with a facilitator that you trust, that can really hold the space for the full spectrum experience. It is really powerful. I know for myself to in repatterning and rewiring my, my own really visceral and reactive patterns to have these new, a new neural network where you actually see a new pathway. It doesn't mean the old ones go. It just means there's new doorways 
that you can walk through and you need to choose to with willpower again and again and again. And you do that by creating just enough space. Like the fact that you're even describing this, that you can see this means there's space between the pattern and your relationship with the pattern, but it takes a lot of, so that's one way of, of supporting oneself. If you are called to, you know, plant medicine, I just, when I think of the neural networks in the brain and the deeply embedded grooves, I'm like, wow, bless the allies that have really supported these breakthrough moments, at least in my own journey and the, the lives of many of my closest friends and clients. And if, if that's not a pathway that someone is interested in exploring, there are a lot of other pathways that work with somatic repatterning and creating the space. So how are you working with that between you and you when you are in relationship and you notice that immediate kind of bypassing or putting aside your own experience of pain? And we get it now, I think, relative to the context of your story where it's like, how much compassion I'm like feeling so much love for the adorable, innocent child of Jade at nine and 11 and 15 and 17, like in the scenario where like your survival was contingent upon, upon your ability to take care of all those around you. And, and, and that was required to receive love, care and relationship in return. So now you're reverse engineering those patterns. So how does it feel when you go against the pattern and what are you doing to reprogram it now? Yeah, that's, there's a lot of, a lot of directions, a lot of ways I can say, I think, um, but I, well, I'll go here first. Um, and then I might ask, ask, have you asked the question, but I, um, I think what, what I'm noticing is when we go through abandonment trauma, and this is something that I've learned in different processes. And also I've done plant medicine as well and EMDR and a lot of different modalities. And I just re- recommend people trying out thing like everything that they can to see what works for them. Um, but I think for me, what's, what's been interesting is, um, I'm jokingly say this, but I'm like, the first step is admitting your problems. But I mean that like, that's like the first step, but meaning it's the first step is like becoming aware of it. Yeah. And when you're aware of it, then you can do something different. But if you're unconscious and you don't see those blind spots, Mm -hmm. it's important to do that. Like the, like different kinds of therapy and, and plant medicine, all these things. So it can bring the unconscious to the conscious so that you can actually then, and then sometimes we don't actually have to do the work. It just automatically shifts in the, in the awareness and the knowing. But if it's something that's deeply ingrained in the wiring and the habitualized patterns, to me, what I notice is, um, and I'll go back to the abandonment trauma. When we, when some people deal with abandonment trauma, what will happen is you, prioritize connection over other things Mm -hmm. prioritize connection over self-honoring you prioritize connection over incompatibility you prioritize connection above all else Mm -hmm. and the thing that i've learned most recently is when i'm desiring connection with someone else over my needs over my desires over whatever it might be Mm -hmm. that i'm actually losing connection to myself Mm. and so what i've noticed is when i'm when i'm desiring that connection with someone else i actually start to focus that energy back towards myself and then i go okay what does it feel like now when i'm connecting with myself more deeply am i still needing that and desiring that thing or what what would self-honoring look like in this moment Mm -hmm. and then doing that thing and then seeing what shifts. So for example, and I shared this with you, there was a, a scenario where um, I I knew that a, uh, a connection with somebody wasn't right for me. Mm-hmm. And, in, um, and in speaking to that and saying, actually, you know, I don't think this is really aligned for me. Mm-hmm. I typically would want the connection over stating this isn't necessarily aligned for me. Mm-hmm. I when I spoke it into existence and when I said, actually, that's not aligned, what I found was I found connection with myself more than anything. Mm. And when I was able to find that and no longer desired that connection above myself. And sometimes in the other deep piece is I sometimes feel selfish doing that. Yeah. That's also part of the wire, the like repatterning, the rewiring of, um, 
I felt my parents were selfish and therefore I didn't want to be that thing. Yeah. So it's like, how do I learn self honoring in a way that is honoring of myself and actually honoring someone else? And that honoring myself is honoring someone else. And we can do that with love and compassion and ease. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a lot, there's a lot of layers there, but I think awareness, being aware of it, checking in with yourself, tuning in when it does, when you do feel that arise, that old pattern or that, somatic response or whatever it might be when you feel it arise going okay let me just be with it pause like do a sacred pause check in and go okay what do I want to do with this information mm -hmm. do I want to go into that old pattern is that serving me or do I want to do something different oh mm -hmm. actually that's not honoring myself isn't serving me anymore yeah. so how can I do that even if it's in a microwave right now by oh. taking a pause and breathing mm -hmm. or it's in a bigger way where I'm like setting a big boundary mm -hmm. but it's just listening it's the tuning and the listening and then um taking those baby steps yeah and there's again it keeps coming up around emotional resilience and like you kind of you go to the gym and you get stronger you know and so like when you if i i love what you said about it could be a micro adjustment but in that moment it's like you're lifting five pound weights you know and so like you're getting like you're you're having to meet the energy that we resist when we change the pattern because the pattern is protecting you from feeling something. And so when you change the pattern, the something you were protecting yourself from feeling will come up to feel. And so we have to feel we're protecting ourselves from being abandoned again. So we do everything we can to sustain connection. Then when we are sustaining connection at the expense of ourselves and we change up that pattern, and we say, I'm going to be self-honoring, we're risking from the perspective of the protector, not sustaining the connection. And when we risk that, the version of you that's honoring yourself is also choosing to be willing to feel the possibility of that connection changing because you're interrupting the pattern that has potentially kept that connection in place in the way that it has been. And so you may not be necessarily creating that outcome. And most of the time you won't. In fact, the relationships that are meant for you will only deepen when you honor yourself because they want you to honor yourself. If it's a relationship, if you're stuck in a, a pattern of caretaking or overgiving, and that is the dynamic that's keeping that relationship in place, you might upset the apple cart. And you might create a ruffle in a, a relationship with someone who pulls their love away from you because you're no longer overgiving and they're used to that. But that's where this emotional resilience comes in. That's where it's like, wow, this is not a relationship that's in my highest alignment if I can't actually honor myself in the face of it. But that means you're, you're like, by changing up the pa protection pattern, you are sort of jumping off the edge of the cliff and trusting the net will appear where the relationships that are in alignment with your truest expression are going to stay and deepen. And you're actually going to trust them more because you risked losing the relationship and then they stay and it only gets deeper. And they're like, I want you to take care of yourself. And then you trust that relationship more and there's a relaxing into, but this is a process of creating reference points. And that takes so much courage because you are going against, it seems sometimes small in the moment. Like we could underestimate the magnitude of changing these patterns. Cause in the moment it's like, this is my best friend. And like, you know, I'm used, especially in our community, like everyone is so de devoted to, you know, freedom and love, right. And like liberation and being our very best selves and self honoring and, and mutual honoring. And, and there's always fine lines with all of it. Like when, when, when is there a shadow expression of everybody encouraging each other to always be self honoring, but then we lose ac accountability to showing up for a relationship. Right. So we're really aiming for balance here. But it, I just want to honor that even small ri that risks that feel small when you're like, I'm used to showing up and overgiving and being there for everybody. But tonight I'm not, I'm not saying yes to the three birthdays that I'm supposed to go to because I, I need to chill. Mm -hmm. Like I need to take care of myself tonight. That feels like, of course, well, you know, that part, those friends are still going to love you, especially in our community, right? There's not like this pressure expectation, but for the little girl who like, whose mom literally did leave for weeks at a time across the other side of the country. Like if you didn't caretake and, and show up in a certain way, there really was this w contingency. And mm -hmm. so it's actually by doing that, it's giving space that night 
for 12 hours for that little girl to come up and she might throw a fuss and a little bit of a fit. And the night of self-honoring, taking a bubble bath and self-caring might actually not feel like a spa night. It might Mm -hmm. actually feel like I'm anxious and nervous and I'm like just worried and I'm man, maybe I should have just gone. So I didn't have to feel this kerfuffle inside of myself, (laughs) but actually that's, that's where the healing happens. That's where the transformation occurs. And that's where on the other side, you can reparent that child and say like, Hey girl, I got you. I'm, this is me choosing you. This is a whole new way of doing it. Even if love got taken away, my love will never get taken away. And that's the only guarantee we can ever, ever, ever make, you know? And so it's just, there's, there's, it's a deep journey. These small things become big things over time. They do. They do. And I think you put that so beautifully and it's so, it's so true. And like when we then after the kerfuffle, I'm going to use that word more often. because <laughs> It's a fun word. It is such a fun word. Kerfuffle. Um, but after that, cause it does happen for me where I get so anxious. I'm like, I need to show up and oh my gosh, what if I don't, but like to then after the aftermath and to be able to be like, Oh, they still love me. Everything's okay. It's like, it teaches our little girl, it teaches her that she's safe, that it's, it's not the same pattern. It's not the same thing. And so it's even in those moments, it's reprogramming. And, I'll, and just to, you know, be transparent, there are times where I've lost friends. I lost my best friend of five years, um, two years ago yeah. for this very, very reason. And it was a, like, I was giving so much and didn't receive anything in return. And I didn't even notice that that, that was happening. Mm-hmm. And Ducky's, Ducky's upset about it. You hear that? Crap? <laughs> he did. <laughs> He's like, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> the long nights of cuddling. Yeah. yeah, exactly. He's like, I licked you so much. Come here, buddy. Ducky, I know it's okay. You don't have to be upset about it. Um, so it, it was just interesting because in hindsight now, and I just want to say this for those who might be listening that have had this experience in fear of losing friends or whatever it might be. Um, I've self-honored with certain people that are my best friends and my family. And then with that particular person, we no longer have a relationship. And honestly, I'm so grateful because it was a lot of energy and a lot of like, mm-hmm. uh, a misalignment there. Yeah. And so what a gift. And sometimes I think we, it's really hard to see it in the moments when it feels challenging and it yeah. feels like just sticky. Mm-hmm. Um, but on the other side, it's like just trusting that the universe is always, always has your back and it's always in your favor. Yes. Always. Mm-hmm. There was also something you shared last night around the way, um, you know, you went through a dark night, like an even dark, dark night within the dark night and the way that you, um, recovered from that. And I'm wondering if you can share a little bit about that piece, because I think it also played a large part in what got you into the entertainment business and your performing and creativity. And so I, I want to talk about how creativity became a centerpiece and a savior for you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh gosh. Where do I begin with it? Um, I'll say, I'll start with the fact that, you know, we talked about me having this very interesting contrast or dichotomy and in, in having the challenges and then also the, the joy and the ease. And I think, um, my mom, we talked about this a little bit, how she would do trades with people in order to build her business. And then yeah. because of that, she would do these trades and then didn't have time because she was working so much to be yeah. able to utilize them herself. So then she would pass them along to me and my brother, but um, mostly I would take them on because I wanted to. And mm. and there were all of these different healing modalities and things. And I, I say all this to say that I don't know that I would have the awareness that I did if I didn't have these tools mm. under my mm. belt. And so I was, you know, we talked about this. I had done Landmark at 13 in the teen course and NLP sessions and rebirthing sessions and all these intuitive healings and past life regression and Akasha Gregor, like you name it, I did it at like such a young age. And simultaneously, I didn't, that was my parent. That was, that was the caretaker. It was like these different healing modalities. And um, while my mom was off, you know, working and then going to, Peru to you know sit with Aya and like you know she was just all over the place and I this was my mom and um and so when I I and simultaneously I didn't know fully how to deal with the pain and the trauma Mm -hmm. that I was going through both of not having the you know the parents around but also 
uh, dealing with the unraveling of the fear and the abuse and all of the things that I'd experienced prior. And so I ended up going into a really dark place. I started doing drugs and drinking at 12. Um, I, I essentially um, got kicked out of school when I was 14 and I was, I started, I was bulimic at 12 and I was cutting myself and it was just to me what I looking back now I'm I'm very clear and aware that all of those different things were my way of dealing as a sensitive being already um dealing with pain because I didn't have the tools to do it and it was my way of controlling the emotional pain the bulimia it was a way of controlling the emotional pain trying to repress it the cutting it was a way to to deal with the emotional pain by creating physical pain it was all all of that and um and when I got kicked out of school, it's because I, I didn't have somebody telling me to go to school at that time. And I ended up getting sent to a continuation school where the students there were terrifying to me. Mm -hmm. It was like they didn't have a care in the world. They were yelling at the teachers as much as I was creating a lot of pain, pain towards myself. It was never, ever towards anybody else. It was always against myself. And what I also noticed is I was recreating the abuse that I experienced. Mm -hmm. I was that abuse towards myself yeah I didn't know any different and so in getting sent to that school it was like a three and a half hour school and I just was mortified at how much people didn't care about life didn't care about each other didn't have any drive in the world and I as um as again challenging as my childhood was I also felt like really blessed where and we didn't talk about this part which was interesting my mom actually gave me a really beautiful gift which was i mean many but um this one in particular when we didn't have all the money but somehow she always figured out how to give me creative outlets mm. so when i was two years old i was in gymnastics and when i was four i was in dance mm. and again we didn't have money i don't know how she did it and then when i was seven i stopped talking mm. because it was unsafe to speak in my house mm. And so my mom said that she, in order to give me my voice back, she wanted to give me singing lessons. Oh, I just got chills. Yeah. And so she was so supportive of the arts because she was a performer back before she became a holistic doctor. She was a performer. She knew the power of creativity and she knew the power of expression um, and wanted to give me that. And that was her way of, of, of mothering. And so I, I got the gift of singing and I got the gift of music and I got the gift of art. And so when I went to this continuation school at 14, freshman year of high school, I would go home and it was only a three and a half hour school program. I would go home and I would study and I would read all of these different books on metaphysics and I'm like asking it is given like all of these like books that we now know today mm -hmm. and I was singing at the top of my lungs because nobody was home and I could mm -hmm. and I was like reading plays and I was um, homeschooling myself to get back into school and I was doing all of this work and I just it was this moment for me I also will say I I, I OD'd on this medication that they put me on and I woke up on my friend's floor seizuring mm. and it was this moment of going this isn't who I am this isn't my life like I I had this creativity in me and I knew that I needed to express it and I knew that I needed like that was my purpose mm. and so I just went I I know I have more than this yeah. Yeah. I know I am more than this and the yes. creativity was the way that I was able to express and move through that pain mm. and so I got myself back in school. I enrolled in every creative program. I was on the dance team. I was, um, became a captain of the cheerleading squad because they had gymnastics in it and I could do gymnastics. And then I became like, I was one of the captains of the, the competitive cheerleading squad. And then I was, there was two different choirs and I was the director of one of the choirs. And then I was in the, th the theater programs and doing the musicals and it was my savior. And I found my joy and I found my expression because I didn't have that before. And it, it was everything for me. And it was such, and it brought me back to life. Yeah. It's emotional saying that, but um, it did. I had chills so many times as you were speaking and that brings us into the present, which all of these, it's like really where pain and purpose can be two sides of the same coin. And I have so much respect for the integrity with which you walk and the place that you're singing from 
it's like really this place of liberation. It's this place of authentic journey work that is not, it's, it's with no external substance other than life, you know, like the journey that you've walked that what you've actually been through, you found your resilience, you found your resolve, like you, you, it got you to the essence, that rock bottom moment with the seizure was like, you knew there was a knowing that is the thing that has you not roll over. That was like, this is, there's more to me and to life than this. And from there, there's this compelling like force that just moved you. It sounds like exactly into your purpose and that place that you create from and your prowess with psychological unwinding and the coaching work that you do and the metaphysical exposure that you had when you were young. It's like your mom gave you so many gifts and your compassion for her trauma and wounding that she went through with her own abuse and where it all came from. You know, it's like the, there's such a comprehensive awareness and understanding. And I just find it to be so beautiful the way you moved through everything that you did the way you've devoted your life both to transformational work within yourself and in support of others and to the arts and to your voice and to creative expression as you know you're, she's a movie star she's a star <laughs> she's one of my friends is a movie star right like it's true yeah. <laughs> Right. And <laughs> such a good heart. I was sharing, you know, with Jade, I'm like, wow, man, like there's so with there's so many ways that many successful artists, musicians, models in the entertainment business, the ego, like how there's such um an emphasis on the physical appearance and you know, the the look, the sound, the perfection of it all. There's such an emphasis in that world, right? Because I also was in sports and entertainment. I was the executive marketing director for a big sports agency and the red carpets and the uh, charity events and the whole thing. It's like, there's a lot of emphasis on the 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 superficial, the, lo the look, right? But the place that you come from is so the opposite of that. It is so deep. It is so deep. And yet you've got the makeup not physical makeup, but like also physical makeup, like you've got the makeup to show up as a performer, as an artist, as right. But the place, everything that's packed in underneath the most superficial layer, which I don't mean that in a negative connotation. I mean that like we all have a superficial layer, the way we appear, which your appearance is you're physically one of the most beautiful humans I've ever seen. And that's where I was like, yeah, Jade, this could have gone left. Like your ego could have got away from you. And it just never did. Like you see how she's been with her animals, even on this podcast, she's like introducing you to Ducky. We had a conversation with her cat before we got on. And just the, the awareness that you bring and the ability to unpack all these layers and everything that you've been through and the kindness that is innate and inherent for you in this school, the continued school you went to where you, 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 it, you, there was a more of an implosive energetic than an explosive energetic. And I have compassion even for the ones that are unkind relative to their trauma, you know, like that all makes sense too. So there's no judgment for the superficiality. There's no judgment for the explosive. There's no judgment at all, but I'm just like, wow, to see you have not get got lost in the sauce, but to be able to show up as a representation of depth and love and humility and power because humility is not a bypass of your power. Humility, that's false humility. False humility is expressing, at, truncating the true power that one would have, either truncating it, repressing it, right? That's like a false humility. And then there's arrogance, which is like over efforting, like, like being in the expre expressed, like over expression. But just actually resting in the truth of like, oh, this is who I am in my power, in my in my full expression. This is what I love and this is where it comes from. I feel like that gets to be such a healing influence in the entertainment industry as well, because bless the artists and the ones that have the makeup you in terms of like athleticism, like a lot of the shows that I see you on, like you are like full blown, like you need to be athletic and, and powerful <laughs> to bring these like fight scenes and all the things that you're doing, which is so fun to witness. Right. But also bringing that like humility. And I'm just curious, as we start to land the, the episode, can you speak to your experience in at the leading edge of your life in, in the entertainment business? And we see now the depth from where that passion came 
Mm-hmm. How how do you experience the fusion between your relationship with spirituality, with depth, with personal development, and with the light parts, like the gifted parts and the shadow parts of the entertainment business? Like where's the intersection? Where do you run into shadow parts of it? How do you meet that? And where are the like biggest gifts? Because the entertainment business, I mean, that's where you, you get to touch at scale millions of people with the essence of your voice, of your presence. And that's, from my perspective, that's good news for the planet. So where, what's your experience? Where do you run into the shadow of it? And how does it intersect with the the journey you've been on at depth? Yeah, thank you for that. First of all, that reflection. I was, I don't know, you've, those who are listening, you can't see me tearing, but just like, I just appreciate it so much. And I just, I love you and I receive you. Yeah, so I'm just taking a breath and just receiving that. Oh, uh, the, you know, it's as you were sharing, a couple things come up in this regard. One is for whatever reason, it feels like a divine life purpose for me to bring in less ego into spaces that I'm going to get emotional. Yeah, um, please do. We like that here. Yeah. So there's this is going to be a random aside, but it's all correlated. So James Lipton used to do inside the actor's studio. And one of the, some of the questions that he would ask is like, what's your favorite quality in someone? What's your least favorite quality? And arrogance was my least favorite quality every time. Because to me, it lacks empathy and compassion. And I think that's what we need more of in this world. And it can be challenging in time at times being in, in a space where there's so much ego And it also is the driving force for me to be like, great, I get to be the, like the light in this dark space. And not to say that it's dark, there's, there's ego in everything, right? There's shadow and light in it. Like everything. And um, I also know the shadow within myself and that's what drives the light. It's like, I love that adage, like you can't see the light without the dark or like you can't see the stars without the night sky, right? There's they both exist. And I want to be one of the brightest stars to, to illuminate in a different way. So it's not just the darkness and how can we illuminate those things in a really beautiful way. And, um, you know, I was joking about this, uh, thing that my dad would do and just talking about the shadow again, how he never complimented me, never would say, I love you and these things. And I saw him a couple of weeks ago and he was joking about how, if he had complimented me, I would be like stuck up with my nose in the air and like, look how great I am is what he said to me. And I was like, um, (laughs) well, I don't know if I agree with that parenting style, but, uh, (laughs) um, and anyway, the point, point being is that I don't know how much of if that, if that was a part that keeps me really grounded in like out of ego, I don't know, possibly. Um, and I've seen a lot of ego and I've seen a lot of arrogance that, mm-hmm. um, and what that does to me is that creates division and separation. And that also, um, creates hierarchy and all of these different things that don't actually exist. Mm -hmm. And so um, I would say the way that I navigate it and, and there's times where I see it in myself, like, I'm just going to be really transparent where I've, I, when I first started on certain shows, like I saw a lot of ego and I was, I couldn't understand it and I didn't know how to navigate it. And there was um, it just, it was overwhelming for me. And then the more you're in an enter- in an industry that mm-hmm. caters to you, enables that, the ego. Like mm-hmm. if I sat on set, for example, and I'll wrap this up and make it as short as possible. But um, if when I was on set, they are catering to you hand and foot. They're like, do you want water? Do you want this? Do you want anything? What do you need? Do you need something? And I'm like sitting in a chair capable of walking to to crafty by myself, but they're constantly asking. And I'm, look, I'm grateful. It's their job. And I'm like, there's a thousand other people on set right now, not a thousand, but hundreds of other people on set right now that could use a water that are working their ass off behind camera that like, I'm just sitting here like, yes, I'm like a face, I'm reading lines and I get to study all these things, but that doesn't make me better than someone else or more deserving of being treated with care. Or they put the actors in front of the line at lunch. And I'm like, they have been literally carrying, lugging around heavy machinery. I am speaking. Yeah. They can go in front of me. Like, and so it's been a really big practice for me to be like, where do I not 
fall in line with like what they're giving and like the habits of the industry Mm -hmm. to actually be like, no, they can go first. Mm -hmm. There's no separation for me and and Mm -hmm. someone else. So let's, and so like, I want to continuously, um, like I even told my brother once, I was like, if I ever become like an arrogant asshole, you literally have permission to punch me in the face <laughs> <laughs> because I was just like, I, I want someone to wake me up. I wasn't saying it like a literal, but yeah, like, of course me yeah. up so that I, cause I don't ever want to like become that it's just for whatever reason, because of my upbringing, because of all of these things, it's just become a mission for me. Yeah, You're coded for it. It's part of your design. And I just, I feel like, I feel grateful in my body and just, I don't know you guys, how like in love with you, with Jade, <laughs> you? like she's the best. Like it's just, you're, you are and, like, you, it's just, I really feel your embodiment. Like you're not just spitting sauce when you're saying that. Like it's, it's really who, like Jade literally physically removed me from her kitchen last night when I was trying to help her clean up at the end. Like she just like really, really is so generous. And so I'm, I think having you, 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 in your design, in your dharma, doing what you love and standing for humility, equality, inclusion, balance in that way is just such a gift. And so thank you for doing what you do. Thank you for walking the way that you've walked. Thank you for being such a good friend and pet mother and love and auntie for Hugo. <laughs> I love him so much. Is it weird that I'm like, he's like his auntie and his boyfriend or girlfriend? Yeah. Yeah. All my, all my girls who, um, who are aunties for Hugo just like decide that he's their boyfriend. So you can also be his girlfriend and his auntie. And (laughs) I'm just, he's surrounded by beautiful women. I don't know what to say. You're welcome, Hugo. Well, he's look at his mama. So, you know, it makes sense. (laughs) Yeah. Well, Jade, I'd love it if there's any, any like shows you have coming out or offerings that you have coming out and just letting everybody know where they can find you. Um, so yeah, let us, let us know. Thanks. I have a lot of things ha- percolating and happening right now. Um, there's a film that I'm doing uh, under blue sky. It's that's uh, shooting in a couple weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, uh, with Octavia Pisano, who's amazing. Um yeah, just incredible actor, director, writer. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm also directing and writing and at the helm of creating this documentary about women in the security business, which is all about um, like, what would the world be like if women were at the helm of making decisions in our safety and security in our world? And a handful of other projects that I'm, I'm working on, I'm really excited about, but you can follow me on Instagram, jade, J-A-D-E dot Taylor with an I-T-A-I-L-O-R. Um, and I always post all the things so you can just keep informed and you'll find me website, all the things, just find my name. You'll find me. (laughs) (laughs) Definitely find her. (laughs) Well, thank you so much, my love for being here. And to all of you who have been listening and receiving so deeply, as always, I'm so grateful for you. And I look forward to seeing you next time.